Well, folks, again, welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. We've got um, a, a good intellectual exercise for you uh, in the time we're going to spend together. America is, as we all know, the only presidential democracy in the world in which the president is elevated, uh, elected, if you will, via an electoral college rather than the direct election of voters or by voters. We are also the only democracy in the world with lifetime tenure for our Supreme Court justices and our constitution is the hardest in the world to change because it requires super majorities, not just in one, but both legislative chambers, plus the approval of three quarters of the states. Today's guests on the Michael Steele podcast have some thoughts about how we begin to reform this system to make us less vulnerable to minority rule. I'm excited to welcome Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, uh, both professors of government at Harvard University and the co-authors of the new book, Tyranny of the Minority, Why American Democracy Reached the Breaking Point. Tune in, join in, coming up next on the Michael Steele Podcast. Bring your pad and paper and some coffee. You're going to love it. You're going to enjoy it a lot. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Michael Steele Podcast. It is uh, always great uh, to be with you, as you know. I love you guys. Uh, you guys show love on me. And, you know, I, I like to, to press the envelope and really kind of push out our thinking about things. So that requires, as we do in most gatherings, bringing really smart people to the table, you know, to help a brother out, because I don't even pretend to know half, let alone all of what's going on out there. And I think we've done that uh, with two very, very uh, smart gentlemen, professors of government at Harvard University uh, and co-authors of the book, Tyranny of the Minority. Uh, it is a real pleasure to welcome both of you, uh, Steve and Dan, you to the conversation. So, uh, hey, welcome, guys. Yes, great. Thanks, Thanks for having us, Michael. It's a real pleasure, uh, as I said, and your book, uh, newly released, uh, This Tyranny of the Minority, Why American Democracy Reached the Breaking Point. Um, you know, I, I, I've been saying in, in this sort of exposition of what's been happening um, since 2015, that there's a lot more historical footnotes to this, a lot more um, places to start before we get to what we've seen play out over the last six or seven years. Um, and this idea of this embrace of authoritarianism, authoritarian figures, this idea of embracing sort of anti-government in the name of reforming or uh, deconstructing the administrative state. Uh, help us sort of set the stage of your book and and what you're driving at right now in trying to get the American people focus on what's happening, the way it's happened, and how we can find ourselves caught up in it um, in a way in which you wake up one day and it's done. <laughs> it's happened. Who wants to start? I'll start. You you redirect me if you want us to go in a, in a different direction. But very, very quickly, you know, we wrote How Democracies Die kind of in a hurry back in 2017, and it came out in 2018. After with the emergence of Trump, that sort of surprised everybody in the United States. So what we did, um, we drew on our research on democratic breakdown in Europe, in Daniel's case, Latin America, in my case, to try to give Americans, to kind of sketch out for Americans what could happen here if we don't watch out. Because obviously most Americans weren't thinking about the collapse of democracy in, uh, in 2016 and 17. And so we just sort of described what can happen in an effort to warn Americans. And then we got a, just a deluge of questions after that book came out from journalists, from citizens, from people everywhere we went, which was, you know, how, how the hell do we get out of this mess? Yeah. And so this second book, is an effort, first of all, to dive deeper into the problem. Because as you're right, Michael, this problem didn't start in 2016. It starts much earlier than that. Yeah. Um, so to, to better understand the roots of the problem and then to think seriously about this question of how do we get out? And that led us into uh, some directions that we didn't expect initially to go in, uh, having to do with our country's institutions. 
Daniel, what what are some of those things that uh, you guys didn't expect uh, in terms of what you found uh, brewing beneath the surface in America as we're all tripping over inflation rates and who's up, who's down, the Kardashians and all the stuff that are mind-numbingly stupid at times that distract. Um, and I was having this great conversation about that distraction with my son uh, earlier today. Um what are some of the things that you found that really are problematic and that are pulsating beneath the surface here that we should be paying attention to? Yeah, so just to, to reiterate something there, I mean, so really it's not, of course, just not all about Trump. Uh, the problems are deeper. Um, you know, it's important to recognize, to try to figure out what those are because unless we confront that, then we'll sort of be back in this moment, you know, very quickly again. Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the big things that we, um, you know, I think we had some sense of, I mean, other scholars have worked on this, uh, but but we really dug a little bit deeper into was the degree to which driving this is a kind of process of a transformation of American society. As America has become more diverse, uh, you know, in the post-1965 world of, of increased immigration and political rights for all Americans, uh, the inability of the Republican Party to cope with that transformation, you know, first, first thriving it, I would say, through the 1980s into the 1990s into the early 2000s, but then really beginning during the Obama era, the inability of the Republican Party to cope with that transformation. So as American society became more diverse, the Republican Party uh, was not able to, to tap into that diversity to win majorities of the vote. And so this sparked two big reactions. Number one, uh, it meant that you know, as a, if a party can't win elections, and this really draws on our knowledge of other cases of democracy and democratic breakdown, if a party can't win elections uh, you know, repeatedly, then there's a great temptation to turn to non-democratic solutions to try to hold on to power. But also a kind of at a deeper level, the reaction of many uh, Republican voters, of course, not all Republican voters, but many Republican voters to the sense of existential threat that, that was perceived with this demographic transformation. So this kind of propelled the Republican Party, or key elements at least of the Republican Party, into a spot that we just really would have never expected in an American, in a thriving democracy. And this really comes from you know, look again, looking at other cases, you know, I studied 19th century Germany and looked at conservatives who were an aristocratic party that couldn't really cope with the rise of the working class. Steve studied Latin American democracies. And, you know, when you have parties that can't win and can't figure out how to turn things around, then start resorting to these other mechanisms of trying to stay in, in power. So that was one big part. And then, the, and then I won't really get deep into this because I think we'll talk a lot more about this, but just kind of as a headline, I mean, the thing that, that really surprised us, because that first part of the story in some sense is pretty broadly known right. at this point. The thing that really got us uh, kind of um, motivated to write this book was this perception that our institutions, rather than making this transformation easier, in some ways is making it more difficult because it's yes. increasingly possible for a party to win power without winning majorities. And if you can do that, uh, then you're not, then this is actually slowing the process of transformation and adaptation. And so this is actually making the problem more. So we, we could talk a lot more about that. Oh, you know, and, and we will, because there's some, some aspects of this that I, I really want to peel back a little bit more, particularly around the electoral college, some of the work that I'm doing with national popular vote and efforts um, rank choice voting and things like that that are trying to, uh, in some cases, work within the construct, but in other cases, uh, redefine the construct of our electoral system. But I, I want to go back to something that both of you put your finger on. And, and I, you know, of course, I'm a very partisan guy. I was head of, you know, the Republican Party and, and you know, dealing with Tea Party and a whole bunch of other stuff that happened on my watch. Uh, both nationally and locally. Um, but one of the things I, I've learned, gentlemen, is that um, a lot of this is easy to kind of put into the Republican bucket uh, and, and not so much into other buckets that could exist out there as well. And so what I have found is the appeal of this sort of right-leaning thinking, the sort of Trumpian clarion call, uh, to rise up against the man, um, it's something that cuts across party lines. Is that is is that something that you've seen in your research as well? That is, yeah, it may emanate and start inside the the right leaning political culture, but that it bleeds fairly freely into other areas and is warmly embraced by those that may surprise you. Because of what I found in the in the political cycle that there was very little that distinguished, for example, 
for example, the Bernie Sanders voter and the Donald Trump voter um, in that election cycle. Um, in fact, I ran into quite a few Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump voters who were very clear that if Bernie Sanders was not the uh, nominee of the Democratic Party, they would be supporting Donald Trump. Um, so how, how, how what was your experience in that regard? Look, there is, um, and I don't think we have our minds around exactly what's going on globally, but there is a striking level of public discontent mm -hmm. and public distrust with politicians and political institutions and governments all around the world. I see it uh, pervasive in Latin America. Daniel's better equipped to talk about Europe, but it's pretty widespread in Europe. Uh, it's hard to find post-COVID a democracy in the world where a majority of citizens say they're satisfied with the status quo. The level of public discontent is deep. It's That's probably been um, exacerbated by social media. That's one element of the mix. I think COVID and its many consequences, the pandemic, uh, the economic consequences, the educational consequences, the lifestyle consequences, I, we're still catching up to exactly the, the political ramifications of of the COVID pandemic. Um, so there's a, there is a lot of, of public discontent that populist politicians, sometimes left wing, sometimes right wing, sometimes centrist, who just say, you know, the, the hell with all of these guys. Uh, we're going to take a wrecking ball to the elite. Right. That can gain a lot of support from from discontented voters across the spectrum. And that sort of populism, uh, again, left, right, sometimes amb ambiguous, ha has had an appeal across demo in democracy across the world. We see it all over Latin America. So it's not too surprising that um, that Trump uh, Trump's appeal casts a wide net and attracts people, I would say, more often uh, white men from across the, the ideological, uh, ideological spectrum, but people across the, the spectrum. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's not surprising. That said, you know, Trump's vote so far, there has been some evolution. There's, there are some, some tweaks, but Trump's vote so far is still not dramatically different from Romney's vote in 2012. It's still a mostly Republican vote. Right. So, so, so to that point, Danny, Danny, you have this, um, this sort of broad swath of um, ideology, ideology that forms up and people kind of move in and out of it, um, to Steve's point, but it does take hold what you, you see it play out in places like Italy, the Brexit movement in, in Ger uh, Germany, in London, um, in Great Britain, for example, um, how do how do you see this environment shaping um, the way we narratively address uh, this populism? Because it seems to me, in many instances, using COVID as an example, the system kind of perpetuates it. The, the system kind of sets up the, the the straw dog, and it sort of creates the enemies. I mean, in in not sort of dealing with the underlying essence of the pandemic right what did we what did we get fixated on wearing a damn mask the very thing you need to protect yourself from the thing that's killing everybody that you know presumably you should be fixated on we were distracted by other things and i think we see examples in europe here in the u.s where that distraction becomes so consuming that the underlying rot is ignored yeah, it's pretty striking, really, that the, there's about 20 to 30 percent of citizens in West European societies and America who are very similar, you know, so that the core of the MAGA vote is not so dissimilar from the 25 percent or so of the vote that went for Maloney's party mm -hmm. or that supports the AFD in Germany. Uh, it's really, you know, it's a really strike. I mean, it's kind of a sociological regularity that there's about 20 to 30 percent of all of these Western societies that look that find these kinds of messages appealing. And, you know, it. Currently in Western Europe, it tends to be on the far right, although, you know, it, it, but I think, you know, to Steve's point, it grows out of disaffection, broadly speaking, you know, so there's there's an anti-immigrant element to it. But what happens, you know, so the AFD to the, the far right party in Germany 
you know, they came to, they, they grew to, to like 25% of the vote, essentially, you know, reacting to the refugee crisis. So very similar and, and familiar to American kind of uh, debates, but, you know, then very quickly have now shifted to be, you know, really against climate, climate legislation or, you know, forcing people to have heat pumps in their homes and they right. you know, quite entrepreneurial right. you know, as, as one issue kind of dissipates, they, they tap into the next issue. You know, first it was COVID, now it's kind of climate change responses. And so I think what that suggests is that there is this deeper underlying satisfaction, which these parties are able to tap into and to foment and to flame, you know, to inflame the issues. And so, um, you know, I'm not, you know, part of, I, so the, so the question, like, again, for the sociologists or the political scientists, trying to understand what's driving this, what's really propelling yes, this. Yes. That's, that's what you're at, asking us. And I, you know, it, it seems to be a mix of these, these, these factors. I mean, certainly, you know, demographic change is a big part of it, but that's not all it is. Uh, you know, it's also a kind of sense of, uh, you know, like the gender, the kind of stuff with gender and transgender identity. This is stuff that's driving this, these, you know, dr these oh, dramatic can, transformations. Can, can, yeah. can I just jump on that? I mean, you, yeah. you you put your finger on a pulse that 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 really, I, I just, the transgendered people, immigrants, black people, brown people, white people, women, people have always been there. There's not like that. It's not like we just suddenly just woke up and said, oh, my God, you mean there's a transgendered person in my community? Yeah, it's because it's your nephew. <laughs> it's your sister. Right. So I don't understand what's driving the sudden push for otherism, the fear of others. Is it I, I, is it the sense that we're become so selfish and insecure? Mm -hmm all at once that we now look at others and blame them for our insecurities and our selfishness. I mean, I think there are two, at least two things going on. And again, we social scientists are running after this thing, trying to, I mean, cause I'm trying to, to figure your, it out real um, quickly to your point, you guys are going to need a couch more than the American people will to figure this stuff out. <laughs> dude. I, was, I know I, I don't envy the work you have to do to really peel back the layers of the onion and the weeping from that that you're going to encounter. <laughs> so a, a, a couple of different streams, though. Um, one, which we don't focus on too much in our book, but is clearly there, is there is a lot of economic insecurity out there among middle classes. Um, there are rising levels of inequality going back decades, stagnating uh, levels of social mobility, and a lot of uncertainty and insecurity since the 2008-2009 financial crisis, both in Europe and the United States. That underlying economic anxiety is almost certainly at play. I think the other factor, people disagree on how much this matters, I personally think it matters a lot, is um, two things are, are going on in the United States a little more rapidly than Europe, but also in Europe. We're undergoing this transition to multiracial democracy, right? Which means a couple of things. One, we're be we are much more diverse than ever before. We're simply a much more diverse society than ever before. But also, we're doing a better job of protecting the rights of the so-called others than ever before. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have gradually, but importantly, advanced in the enforcement of civil rights legislation since the 1950s, and 1960s, and Groups that have been at the margins and uh, maybe, you know, effectively stayed in the closet for decades and decades and decades, who, of course, were there, but were didn't feel empowered, legally empowered, socially empowered to say, hey, I'm here. Now, in the 21st century, feel they have the, 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 the power to say, hey, I'm here. Protect me. Protect my rights. And so there are there are more rights being demanded than there were 50 years ago. Uh, which I think is a good thing. But um, we have in the United States, we're going through this, this transition in which a, a overwhelmingly dominant ethnic group uh, and, and, you know, in, in effect, to simplify, white Christian men, mm -hmm. um, white Christians are losing their electoral majority, their numerical majority, but most importantly, they're losing their dominant status, their dominant position in social, economic, cultural hierarchies, for the first time. And that's a really threatening thing. And I think that that is personally, I think that that's at the core of the kind of radicalization of 
elements of the right across the West. So that's why, so, so then you would say, and that's why you argue in the book that we see democracy so much under assault right now, uh, more than we see, as you noted, maybe in Europe and, and elsewhere as a wealthy uh, nation, um, intellectually on top of its game, uh, economically powerful, politically powerful, militarily powerful, and yet just stuck on the stupid of diversity, just stuck on the idea that, oh my God, you mean there are equally wealthy uh, and capable, competent players who don't look white, male, and Christian who can come in and be as dominating on this landscape as we have been. So the idea of actually sharing in that, where we can take you know, uh, a person of color who is all about the American ideal and promoting the American ideal, despite all the other issues that we have to deal with, um, they still come off threatened by that. Yeah, I think, you know, th there's a sense in which equalization feels like status loss, you know, uh, and so yes. that's, you know, well when, you, when, you, when you've been in a privileged position, then just having to compete on a fair, you know, the Harvard Library, Harvard Widener Library, uh, which is a massive, you know, beautiful library that you can go in to do incredible work. For most of Harvard's history, women weren't allowed into the library. You know, even if you were a Radcliffe student, you had to get, you know, special permission. So, you know, think about the kind of monopoly on, on right. knowledge that that, and so that's just symbolic. I mean, that's, you know, we, that, we didn't even talk about that in the book, but that just recently occurred to me. You know, that's sort of a, the model of which, you know, you have the kind of uh, kind of stratified hierarchy, equalization, the equal, the level playing field, this is kind of can be for some people perceived as a, as a major threat. So I, I want to I, I want to shift to what I think facilitates the threat more than anything else, and emboldens it, gives it value, and gives it uh, face, uh, and that is political leadership. You, you you talk about in the book this idea of. Um, uh, or question, you know, this idea of what what does it mean for you know a party to be committed to democracy, and I want I want to address I want you to address that. So what is that a party committed to democracy? But then I have a part B to that uh, that I think animates and drives that more than anything else, uh, and that is the men and women who we call leaders who we identify and define as our leader. So let's start with the first part, addressing what you talk about in the book around, you know, exactly what does it mean to be a party committed to democracy? So um, we, we try to offer a really simple definition. Here we draw heavily on the political scientist Von Linz, um, who is taught at Yale uh, for, for many, many years. We argue that to, to call a party uh, committed to democracy, it has to do three things. It has to always accept the results of elections, win or lose. Pretty basic, kind of the cardinal rule of democracy. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and very importantly these days, has to unambiguously denounce, renounce, eschew political violence in all forms. Must be willing to 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 denounce and break from unambiguously violence. Mm -hmm. And third, ultimately, most importantly, I, I hope this is where we focus our dis discussion is that the, the party has to be willing to denounce and separate itself from anti-democratic extremists on its own flank, Bingo. right? It's very easy for people on the left to denounce far right wingers who are, you know, they call fascists. It's very easy for people on the right to denounce communists. But the really critical test is when an authoritarian threat emerges in your camp. And debt parties that are committed to democracy always expel and denounce and politically renounce elements that are threats to democracy. Parties that kind of hide under the table and maybe justify or engage in both sidesism or condone or even protect those anti-democratic extremists, they are the ones that get us into trouble. So, Stephen, you put your finger on the exact point I want to go to next, because uh, there's this great quote 
uh, from your book, uh, I believe it's like on page 40, 41, in which you say, quote, openly authoritarian figures like coup conspirators or armed insurrectionists are visible for all to see. By themselves, they often lack the public support or legitimacy to destroy a democracy. But when semi-loyalists tucked away in the hallways of power lend a hand, openly authoritarian forces become much more dangerous. Democracies get into trouble when mainstream parties tolerate, condone, or protect authoritarian extremists when they become authoritarian enablers. Indeed, throughout history, cooperation between authoritarians and seemingly respectable, respectable semi-loyal Democrats, small d, has been a recipe for democratic breakdown. You have for me, when I read that passage, went, that is it. That has been my frustration inside my Republican Party, watching the likes of Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy and others enable this authority. I'm going to be a little crass, gentlemen, so forget it's not the most politically correct nor philosophically prudent thing to say, but enable Your show. the... If I, <laughs> that's one way to look at it. Uh, but but enable these, these authoritarian assholes to go out and spew their bile, their vitriol, their bullshit, feeding the masses, allowing it to happen. So you don't get to condemn insurrectionists on Wednesday after January 6th, and then three weeks later go embrace the one who set up the insurrection. And that that split screen, if you will, in American politics, it is what drives me so crazy right now within my own party. And you know, folks who listen to me know why I stay, because it pisses them off because I wanna hold the mirror up every day to show just how full of crap they are. You can't get to do that. And as we're watching right now, gentlemen, the self-same enabler, Kevin McCarthy, after 15 ballots of placating and BSing around to try to become speaker, now will lose his speakership by the very people, right? That he has enabled. That quote, is what the end game for me is all about. So I leave it to you gentlemen to decide, dissect what I just said, <laughs> right so, or wrong. But that's, I thought that quote was so right, spot on. Yeah, so it's, it's enraging, it's morally, you know, inexcusable. But I think, you know, you, it, it, for our purposes in our book, and we provide some evidence of this, it's also incredibly dangerous and reckless for democracy. It's not just a matter of, oh, well, you, we can condemn this behavior because we think it's not really a morally acceptable thing to do. It's it's incredibly dangerous. And there's lots of historical evidence showing that's the case. I mean, we, we provide the story of, we give an account of this event in France that took place February 6th, 1934, when there was an assault on the French parliament, you know, militia guys in the streets with weapons, very similar to January 6th, they attacked the parliament building, but the police beat them back. And you might think that was the end of it, but it turns out there were guys in the parliament building, politicians, in mainstream politicians in the parliament building who were in on it. They knew what was going to happen. And rather than coming out and holding these guys to account and prosecuting them and holding an investigation of them, they excused it, they justified it. And what this did to French democracy in 1934 was it weakened the immune system of French democracy. And so by the time the Nazis invaded in 1940, uh, you had a whole group of figures who had participated in those assaults who then were lined up in a sort of almost like a kind of uh, fraternity organization to get these guys, recruit these guys into the new Vichy authoritarian government. So the participants in that attack, because they were uh, they were not held to account, later served as, you know, in the most atrocious kinds of positions in this Nazi supporting regime. So the, the point is that the mainstream politicians didn't respond. Right. They excused it they, out of out of short-term expediency. You know, of course, we understand, you know, we're political scientists. We understand, you know, careerism is a good thing. You know, careerism as a democracy is essential. People look out for their interests. They want to have a successful career. But when democracy is at stake, you have to come, you have to draw a hard line and say this is unacceptable because you're really putting your democracy at risk. And there's a great temptation to kind of think, to come up with all sorts of rationalizations. Well, we need to be in the room because if we're not here... Uh, then you know right. it's going to be worse. But the thing is, you hear the same excuses over and over. Now, maybe I'll just one last line here, and then I'll let Steve, you know, say this. So, um, you know, Hannah Arendt. I want to quote Michael Steele, but I'll, I'll <laughs> yes. wait. Okay, wait Hannah, my turn. Arendt, uh, <laughs> Hannah Arendt, the great uh, uh, Jewish German philosopher, looking back on at January 1933 when the Nazis came to power, 
I saw an interview with her recently, um, you know, that was recorded in the 50s, where she said the thing, you know, people will misunderstand, you know, for 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 J Jewish Germans looking at what happened in January 1933, what shocked us was not what our enemies did. We we knew what our enemy, we knew what the Nazis were. What shocked us is what our friends did. Yes. And, you know, that's it. That's that captures it, you know. Man, that, that sure does. Steve. No, just to just to reinforce Daniel's point. Um Again, politicians are going to do what's best for politicians so that they, they can uh, get reelected and, right. and advance in their political careers. We we know that in, in normal times, you know, you may not love it, but it's it's the way no politics works in normal times. But um, when when democracy threatens us and you and a politician is willing because you know what they think and what they say in private. When they're willing to, uh, you know, vote to acquit Donald Trump the second time in the U.S. Senate, or when they're willing to um, to endorse Donald Trump's candidacy in 2024 after an effort to overturn an election, um, that sort of careerism is incredibly dangerous. And you said, I just want to, uh, you, we interviewed you for this book. You won't remember saying this. But you said there is not a public office in the world that's remotely worth putting democracy at risk. That is an example of a what we call a loyal small d democratic attitude. That's the attitude that uh, yeah. that uh, that Liz Cheney took, that Adam Kinziger took, that a number of, of principal Republicans took. But unfortunately, they are you are a, a a tiny minority of the Republican Party leadership. And it's been it's been frustrating as all get out as you as you can well imagine, and it it leads to a lot of the the conversation that I think we have to have now, uh, because the 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 leadership is so uh, broken. Um, how do we engage the citizenry to sort of take up that mantle of responsibility? Um, you guys talk about, I believe it's uh, later in the book in around chapter seven or so about the, you, you give the example of the, the group of 12 Nor Norwegian, 112, I think it was, Norwegian men uh, who decided to write constitution. It's now the world's second oldest constitution. That process of, of sort of taking responsibility and control of the direction of your country and and what it's going to stand for how do we how do we capture that or recapture it or you know if we've ever really had it and we just kind of fooled ourselves into thinking that you know the words on paper will just magically protect us <laughs> right um or does it require some level of, of citizen action um particularly when the leadership fails so miserably in, in doing the very thing they should do to protect the democracy itself. Well, I mean, our, our constitution is um, obviously a pretty successful document, right? It, it's, it's a brilliant document that has served this nation well in many respects over a very long period of time. It's the oldest uh living constitution and it is arguably the most successful but there's one thing i think our generation has forgotten which is ever since 1787 and in 1787 george washington wrote a letter to a friend the year just weeks or months after the, the constitution was written calling the constitution an imperfect document and saying mm -hmm. that it would be up to future generations to perfect it and that's what Americans have done through most of our history. Sometimes it's the leaders. Sometimes it's activists from below. Sometimes it's a combination. But for most of our history, beginning with the Bill of Rights, just two years after we wrote the Constitution, through Reconstruction, the expansion of suffrage, the progressive era, uh, the, the, the key constitutional reforms of the early 20th century, for most of our history, we've done the work of uh, working to make our political system better, making it more democratic. And the odd thing about the last half century, about basically our lifetimes, is we've kind of stopped doing that work. We've sort of frozen the Constitution, and we've stopped talking about making the system better. Uh, and, and that's unfortunately allowed the United States to kind of fall behind other democracies in the world. 
I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I would just say, I mean, it's 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 easy or tempting to kind of regard what Steve just said as a kind of radical statement. <laughs> you know that that you know we have this document that's great, so why why mess with it? But you know the thing that's that's based on a misunderstanding that that the you know I, you know we take a loyalty oath to the Constitution and we need to do that, and that's wonderful. We need to defend the Constitution. But part of the, what makes the Constitution so great is not only what was written in 1787, but what has happened since then to the Constitution. You know, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, uh, you know, let alone the 13th Amendment. The, right. you, know, you know, all of these things that we value, that we defend, came about through constitutional change and change. And just, I mean, not, not only constitutional change, but institutional reforms. And so it's, you know, there's a great American tradition of doing this. And so, you know, I think we need to realize that that, that in fact, is the kind of the patriotic and in some sense conservative thing to do is to continue to do this and that we're kind of engaged in a, in a bit of an experiment here of what happens. Let's see what happens if we don't do this work. And I think the results are pretty clear. It's not so great. But gentlemen, you, you, you even state in the book that America is an outlier in this regard, right? Uh, our constitution yeah. is the most difficult in the world to change. Uh, we have structures that are in place, for example, uh, the permanency, if you will, of the Supreme Court, right? It's just, it, they're there for life. <laughs> it's, all right, you get on, you're there till you die. We see now how, and I, I kind of refer to it this way, um, how the system sort of turns in on itself. Now, when we chatted uh, in, in preparation of the book, we, you know, we didn't get into that that granular level of discussion around this idea of the system turning in on itself. But has has our system in a way uh, been turned in on itself as we're looking at it today? When we see now the corruption of that court, we see now the breakdown of the various institutions that are supposed to support the pillars of democracy, whether it's our justice system, uh, or our uh, economic system, or whatever it happens to be, now being used against the people, all right, because we are a government of, by, and for the people. Um, how how would you describe that, um, uh, this in particular environment that we find ourselves in relative to what we see and what you talk about uh, happening globally, um, using it as you did in this particular part of the book, uh, the Norwegian example, uh, the European model, if you will. What what do you say that to that? Well, you know, so we talk about Norway because it's the world's second oldest written constitution. So it's almost as old as the U.S. So it's a nice nice example of a country that began much less democratic than the United States at its founding with a king and aristocratic upper chamber. But over the, over the centuries, it's been amended hundreds of times. And again, exactly for the reason you say, it's hard to amend the U.S. Constitution. Doesn't mean it's impossible. Right. But over time, these institutions that we have and that other countries used to have, like an electoral college, every other country in the world got rid of its electoral college for selecting presidents. Uh, we're the only ones left with this. Every other country dealt with the same problem of courts a little out of control. After 1945, judicial review developed in most democracies around the world. And everybody faced the same challenge of, on the one hand, we want our courts to be independent absolutely critical to have independent judiciary, not politicized. On the other hand, we don't want a court that's so out of sync with where the people are that it that it's, you know, that it's dangerous. And so the way to deal with that dilemma, other countries have said, well, you know, what we do is we have term limits. You know, this is not such a radical idea. And other every other country, every other democracy in the world has this. Um, every other democracy with its has it had a second chamber. Some countries got rid of their second chambers altogether. Mm -hmm. Other, you know, I don't, we don't think that that should be the case. The U.S., obviously, I mean, I think that any federal system usually requires a Senate type of body. But other countries over time made those upper chambers more proportional to population. So this all made, also made us an outlier. And we're the third least representative upper, have the third least representative upper chamber in the world after Argentina and Brazil. And then finally, just one other institution I'll mention is that it's not a constitutional institution, but rather the institution of the filibuster, which, you know, there's good arguments that we've heard, of course, for why we need to, you know, you have a filibuster in the uh, Senate to block a potentially overreaching president. You know, imagine if Trump comes back into office and wants to abuse office. But the reality is every other democracy got rid of this kind of institution and democracy has survived. And so we are left again, once, in, once again, an outlier. So if you add up, e each one of these is an outlier. Each one on their own wouldn't be so kind of devastating. But when you add all of them together, this leaves us in a situation where uh, increasingly majorities don't, you don't need majorities to win power. 
And this has a really distorting impact on our politics. Um, let me may, maybe just add one more thing on this, um, sure. which is that, you know, we in a certain way we have a kind of uh, market analysis of democracy. I mean, the way that democracy is supposed to work is parties are supposed to compete for voters. When you lose, like a firm, what does a firm do when it loses customers? It, you get a new CEO, you you know come up with a new strategy, you try to find new customers. That's how that's how democracies are supposed to work. You know, think of the Democratic Party after the, through the early 1990s. You know, re lost repeatedly through the 1980s. Bill Clinton comes along, come up mm -hmm. with a new strategy, come up with new leadership. Um, and you can regain uh, regain uh, office. The British Labour Party, similarly, you know, after many years in the wilderness, under Tony Blair, revamps itself, comes up with a new ideology, new new program, new proposals, new leaders. And this is how democ democracy is self-correcting, a little bit like a market. But we live in a situation today in a system w in which, since you don't need majorities to win power, the incentives to adapt are increasingly not there, especially That's for right. the Republican Party. And so. You know, it's not the politicians aren't, you know, you know, we people talk about a cult and so on, a cult of Trump, you know, maybe for some voters, that's the case. But political, that, you know, suggesting that it's all irrational, political leaders are doing the, you know, doing the rational thing, given our institutions, why try to win a popular majority of the vote for the presidency? Of course, it doesn't make any sense. And so because the Republican Party can win power without winning majorities. And so it breaks this kind of self-correcting logic of, of democracy. And I think it poisons the political system in the result. We're going to take a quick break. We're having a wonderful conversation with the authors of Tyranny of the Minority, Why American Democracy Reached the Breaking Point, Steve Levitsky and Daniel. Daniel, I, I don't want to script your last name again because I did in the promos, but it's Ziblatt, right? Ziblatt. Ziblatt. Got it. I, yeah. Yeah, I had to redo that promo, but do so Ziblatt. Got it. So we're, we're going to be right back right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the Michael Steele podcast. Uh, great discussion. Um, so I'm hoping folks have been taking notes and paying attention because there will be a test on Tuesday uh, on, on what we're talking about here, our democracy and the tyranny of the minority um, with uh, Stephen and Daniel. Um, I, I want to shift gears uh, to talk a little bit of because you alluded to it uh, as we were going to break about the systems and one of those important cogs in the system is the electoral process, how we elect a president. Um, unlike all the other offices, every other office in the country, um, we require uh, this sort of uh, arcane mechanism known as the electoral college. You refer to democracies uh, around the globe, eliminating that from as a feature uh, to uh, the election of their leadership. We do not have the direct election of the president here in the United States. We elect electors who then go uh, do do the, the work uh, in state capitals. Talk to us about how that distorts the process, in your view, uh, if it does. Um, and what are some of the remedies uh, to address address that? Uh, given that I don't know if we're going to have a constitutional convention to uh, eliminate the electoral college anytime soon. Well, we don't we don't need a constitutional convention to eliminate the, the electoral college. There have been many, many, many efforts throughout American history to either reform or abolish the electoral college. We got very close. I think Americans forget this. In 1969, uh, the uh, the leaderships of both political parties supported a constitutional reform to abolish the electoral college. President Nixon supported uh, a constitutional amendment to abolish the electoral college. All of our major interest groups, the uh, AFL-CIO, mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce, uh, the American Bar Association, overwhelming majority in the House and a majority of senators all supported abolishing the uh, the Electoral College, but they didn't get the two thirds of the votes needed to to to, uh, to get it through the Senate and it and it died. Um, I think it's important just to, one bit of background to to recall that the, the Electoral College is not some sort of brilliantly crafted democratic institution when when the framers were 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 designing our republic in in the hot summer of 1787 this was the first um president in the history of the world right we were designing a uh, the, really the first large republic in the world nobody knew how to to uh, to select a leader outside of monarchy monarchy was really the only game in town across the Western world. And so these guys were uh, in uncharted territory. 
They did. They literally there was there was no model to, to borrow from. They went through a variety of options. One option was direct election of the president. Madison was actually pretty sympathetic to that, but it didn't have support in the whole convention in part, not entirely, but in part because the uh, slave holding South right. feared being outvoted by, by Northern voters. Uh, so it was shot down. There were, uh, there was a, there were other alternatives. The, ty the tyranny of the minority. <laughs> Again. Yeah. So this goes way back. Uh, there were, they were um, Madison also proposed a system that would be like contemporary parliamentary systems in Europe. Uh, that was also shot down. Um, and the uh, the Electoral College was kind of a third best solution that was adopted because no other alternative could pass. Um, and uh, its designers, including Hamilton, kind of envisioned it as uh, as a body in which these sort of uh, elites, notables, uh, not very political, would kind of gather. They would be wise men that would kind of check the 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 the, the voters. Um, it never worked that way. Never once worked that right. way because. The framers didn't envision political parties. Uh, they The Constitution was designed before political parties were really a thing. So very quickly, parties emerged and, and uh, the Electoral College became a partisan affair as it is today. Um, so it never it never worked as our framers imagined it. It was not our framers top choice. Um, it was a little bit of a, it was a lot of improvisation. Um, and so we shouldn't sort of reify it as some kind of a of, of a of a brilliant document the problem with it i mean it's it's always it's it's always less democratic to indirectly elect your leader than right. to directly elect your leader so there's a an argument that it's just simply a less democratic way of electing your leaders uh it was very democratic for 1787 it was the most democratic system on earth right. in 1787 but a lot of time has passed since 1787 um, but the the real problem comes with the with the electoral college in the rare but increasingly common event that the electoral college produces uh, a winner who didn't actually win the popular vote, and that is simply unfair. I think by any democratic standpoint, there have been times in history when it's leaned unfair to Republicans. There have been times in history, like now, where it leans unfair. To Democrats, but no matter what, and you know, we 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 represent more than one party on this screen. Uh, it's un it's unfair where the when the loser of an election wins the the presidency. Um, it's become a, a particularly acute. Pro it's not an accident that it's happened twice in in this century and could happen a third time in twenty twenty four. It's a product of the fact that the electoral college is mildly biased towards sparsely populated territories mm -hmm. and um in the 20 it, that was never an issue really in the past because through most of our history both parties whatever the major parties were had urban and rural wings throughout the 20th century the democrats right. and republicans had urban and rural wings it's only in the 21st century that our parties have realigned such that the democrats are overwhelmingly based in metropolitan areas and Republicans are overwhelmingly based in sparsely populated territories. So through no fault of their own, Republicans have an advantage in in the Electoral College. And um, it's producing outcomes in that that are not only unfair, but as Daniel pointed out, dangerous, right? If we didn't have the Electoral College, there never would have been a Trump. The Republican right. Party would have followed a very, I think, a very different path had Trump lost the 2016 election rather than won it. I think that's right. Uh, how do you how do you see it, Daniel? I, I think that the, that plays out exactly right. Um, and, you know, for those of us who are working in the, the, you know, space of reforming the Electoral College process, uh, whether it's, you know, with ranked choice voting or national popular vote, um, final five, et cetera, something that disrupts. And I think that disruption actually begins with the primary process. I advocated as national chairman, the abolition of our primary process. Uh, if, if not the, if not that, then, okay, let's just remake it and jumble the players so that you don't have, you know, the country start or the party starting off its electoral process 
by voting in from the whitest, one of the whitest country, states in the union and projecting that, oh, well, this is how the election is going to go. You know, it's like, well, no, because it's going to change when you go to other places. So how, how do you assess this electoral college conundrum that we find ourselves in, which in many cases has debilitated, contributed to the debilitation of the electoral process? We talked a bit about how this is, is distorting, you know, and, and Steve said in 2016, you know, Trump would have lost 2020, you know, uh, tr Trump uh, lost. But without, you know, without an electoral college, I, it's sort of hard to I mean, it's hard to, of course, speculate conclusively on this. But you kind of imagine, would there be a doubling down on the Trump route to the presidency without the electoral college? Imagine a world without the electoral college. I think it's, you know, we, the world would look very different. So now how, how do we get out of this bind? I mean, I think you rightly point out this is a difficult hill to climb to imagine the reform, the abolishment of the Electoral College. You know, you can imagine, though, you know, let's say Texas goes um, Democratic, you know, would, would suddenly, you know, some Texas Republicans think, well, maybe this would be sort of nice to not have to have the Electoral College constraint. Of course they would, in a heartbeat. Yeah, so this, right. I know those folks, yes. Yeah, so this would, this, you know, so 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 the, there's ways in which this could tip things. I mean, back in 1969, 70, it was a third party candidacy, George Wallace, that triggered everybody's fears. And real. so I think, you know, people make a cal short-term calculus, but there's other routes to reform. You've mentioned some, you know, there's also, you know, one, one other way in which the, this kind of imbalance could be addressed is by ch changing the size of the House of Representatives, because of course the elect electors yeah. are selected based on the so number of senators and the number of members of the House of Representatives. You know, throughout our history, this is, so in our last chapter of our book, we have these 15 proposals. This is one of them. That's what I was so, getting to. Go for it. Yeah. So, you know, so over the last, uh, you know, every, you know, every, after every census, there's a kind of, uh, redistricting of districts and so on. And what happened up through the 1920s was that the house expanded as the population expanded. Beginning in the 1920s, when the house was expanded in the 1920s, it's never been expanded since. And so we're stuck with the number of members of the House of Representatives we have. And so as these, and as a population has grown, this means each congressional district has increased dramatically in size. So there's actually a pretty good argument for saying, well, you know, our House, you know, you can't have thousands and thousands of members of the House of Representatives, but could be a little bigger. And if it were a little bigger, congressional districts would be smaller. And this would mean that larger states, Texas, California, would have more representation in the Electoral College. So this is a way of addressing the imbalance without a constitutional amendment. Um, you know, the, another idea that's out there is to say, well, you know, the winner take all nature, uh, and this was something that was discussed in 1970, the winner take all nature of the Electoral College. Why is that necessary? You know, right. assign the electors based on port, the portion of the population that uh, each presidential candidate gets. You know, this would also be a way of making it more representative. Overall, though, as you say, with, between the primary process and the Electoral College, we have a really screwed up process of selecting <laughs> a president, and we're suffering the consequences. And this is our democracy. This is not from the Ark of the Covenant. This is this is a man-made institution that we have every right to think about. Like, how do we make our lives better? And that's that's sort of essentially what we're arguing for. So, as I as I wrap up our conversation, I, I can really drill down with you guys so much on so many aspects of what you lay out in the book, uh, folks. And I cannot repeat enough how important it is to to get your hands on a copy of Tyranny of the Minority. So you can begin Just in to case you don't know what it looks like. There you go. That's it right there. That's it. Uh, it it's, it's important to, so you to understand um, informing your mind about the space you live in and the decisions you have to make will get not only make you a better citizen, but produce hopefully better results. So gentlemen, what, how would you, um, uh, sort of encourage, uh, but strongly remind Americans uh, about the balance we find ourselves uh, in right now. How would, you, how, would you, how would you ask them to assess, uh, to encourage them to participate and become more involved in and in yeah. understanding the balance of, of things right now relative to our democracy? Yeah, I would, I would say that one of the great you know, there's this notion of a self-fulfilling prophecy and that the worst kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in the world is to say, I'm not going to participate because uh, I'm not going to have any impact. And of course, you think that you not participate and you have no impact. And so, you know, this is this is our democracy, you know, every citizen's democracy, and it's in our hands. And, you know, there have been moments uh, in our history where citizens have taken the charge very seriously. I was looking at the Progressive Party platform, Theodore Roosevelt's party platform in 1912. It's this long document with all of these ways of improving our lives. And I think, you know, it's very tempting 
given the dysfunction of our institutions and the inability to base address basic problems to sort of think, well, throw our hands up and say, none of this, none of this uh, is possible. There's nothing we can do. But you know, that 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 frame of mind is, contributes exactly to the problem. And so citizens need to be engaged, need to vote, and need to recognize that when somebody is a threat to democracy, you shouldn't vote for them. That's the, the sort of essence of it. Because if you vote, you know, prom, despite what people think, politicians often do what they promise to do. Uh, and if a politician promises that he's going to lock up his opponents, if he's going to arrest, you know, harass the media, you know what, when he's in power, he may very well do that. So, uh, you know, take the take words matter and voters have a grave responsibility. Yeah, that's especially important when you consider when they promise to uh, to, you know, build roads and bridges um, that doesn't get done. But when it's going to be locking up some folks, <laughs> you can pretty damn sure <laughs> you can see that happen. How about you, Steve? How, how, how do you take us out of here, man? I, first of all, it's important to remember that um, we did rise, we we did respond as a society to the threat that Trump posed in 2016, 17, when he got elected. Uh, it took a, really almost all of us by surprise. Uh, very, very few Americans were worried about or thought about defending the, the need to defend democracy. But people went out and, and did in a variety of different ways. Uh, journalists, citizens, business people, uh, a lot of politicians, election workers, state officials, local officials all across this country did stand up for democracy between 2017 and 2021 and helped us save it. Now, the, unfortunately, the threat is not over. It continues. Uh, preserving democracy is hard work. So I think what one really important thing is, and I'm just going to say two things. One is go out, go out, get out of your house and join organizations. It, it doesn't matter that much what the organizations are. I mean, there are some organizations I would not recommend joining, but um, there are lots of ways to help democracy. Um, and getting out of your house, getting offline and actually joining organizations yeah. of human beings, with, working yep. with, with other people does a lot of good and it, it it fortifies our civil society leaves us in a better position to mobilize and defend democracy when we need it so go out and join a, a cause broadly related to democracy of your choosing if you care about voting rights great if you care about civil rights great if you care about youth participation great whatever it is go join the other thing just to to hopefully leave on a little bit of hope is um what gives what keeps me going and gets me out of bed in the morning is the fact that younger generations, I think, are much, much better equipped to take our country across that line into uh, into multiracial democracy than than we are and our right. older generations. The, the two key pillars of multiracial democracy are an acceptance of diversity and support for racial equality. And that may it may that may sound very simple, but it's only in the 21st century that majorities of Americans have really polls show that majorities of Americans actually support both of those things and that those majorities are far and away strongest among younger people. So our task, the way what, what I see is our task is giving that younger, those younger generations voice, uh, making the changes needed so that those emerging majorities are not thwarted by uh, relatively small partisan minorities. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, you you have uh, shared a word today, and I really appreciate uh, the the time and the effort you've put into uh, reframing our thinking and understanding about our democracy and, and appreciating the moment we're in. Uh, and you do it so expertly through the book, uh, Tyranny of the Minority, Why American Democracy Reached the Breaking Point. Uh, really appreciate you taking that time. Uh, folks, go Sorry out, again. get a copy. There it is. I'm going to put it up one more time. Let's just hold it there for a second just so we get that shot, baby. There it is. Ah, yes, the money shot. <laughs> uh, but we really, really do appreciate it. It was, it was a treat for me uh, to participate a uh, little bit that I did. Um, but it's, it's, it's a more important uh, lesson for all of us to take away from your writing. So folks, the book, again, Tyranny of the Minority, um, and go out and grab yourself a copy of it. Uh, Steve, Daniel, thank you guys so much. Uh, really appreciate you taking time 
uh, here on the Michael Steele podcast. Thanks, Thank Michael. We're big fans of what you're doing. I appreciate that very much. So that does it for this time together, folks. Just remember to show the love, do the download thing, check out the book, Tyranny of the Minority, Why American Democracy Reached the Breaking Point. You can find it on all the, the big websites, uh, Amazon, et cetera, uh, to download your copy. Um, please read it. It's good reading. Until next time, be safe, be well out there. Uh, you can follow these gentlemen. You guys on Twitter or anything like that? I, I, I think, Dan, Dan you I, are on at D-Z-I-B-L-A-T-T. That's right. Uh, and um, definitely check out uh, Daniel there. Uh, Steve is is probably the saner of the two of us. He has no Twitter account. <laughs> he, he figured you can, you out. You can write me a letter. <laughs> <laughs> write him a letter. <laughs> Spoken like a true professor. <laughs> Old school. All right, folks, until next time, be safe, be well. God bless. 